say friends uh, good afternoon to all of you and welcome you to this afternoon session on national skill qualification framework in the morning we had the uh, inaugural session wherein we had mr b purta sarta director of technical education government of punjab as the chief guest and he shared his views about uh, leadership and national skill qualification framework thereafter our director dr mp punya engaged a session on skilling india and uh, he shared the skill development scenario now we all are aware of national skill qualification is something which is being talked about quite a lot in today's context and the concept of the framework is not really very well understood by everybody that's why this program so i am going to engage this session on national skill qualification framework and we'll discuss about uh, as to why the framework was evolved how it has been evolved what exactly is the architecture of national skill qualification framework and uh, how is it the government wants to take it forward so all this we are going to talk about in the morning i shared some of my concerns with you now again i would like to throw a little more light on some of the other burning problems and then we'll try to link the present scenario with skill development and having linked it with skill development and nsqf then i'll share with you the operational mechanism of nsqf now we are located in punjab and let me start from uh, the kind of scenario which exists in punjab and some of the disturbing trends and i personally feel something which is happening in punjab is perhaps happening almost all over the country so when we talk of punjab state what we find is the number of farmers reduced 12% in punjab during 2001 to 2011 yes please one group and two group is class so this group pertains to national skill qualification framework i get constructed that is the other one you uh, other one where is contact it? professor anand thank huh? you the other building okay no number uh <coughs> you got to find out from the reception studio number kitna ye malum nahi kaun si class mein hai conference hall mein conference hall they it would be in the other building okay so i'll i was just uh, talking to you about the kind of scenario which exists in punjab in the morning i shared with you the broader uh, you know scenario and uh, i was sharing with you that almost 14 crore farmers they uh, they left farming over a period of 5 to 6 years so when we talk of punjab in punjab during almost uh, 10 years period that's from 2001 to 2011 almost 12% people they have left farming then it's not only reduction in number of farmers in punjab there is also a drop in farm labor during the same period whereas the number of farmers reduced by 12% the number of farm labor reduced by 21% we are all aware of the use of technology in farm sector so in fact farming is slowly becoming highly mechanized people have started making use of technology use of tractors other uh, agriculture equipments and farm sector is becoming highly sophisticated and highly mechanized so the use of technology in farm sector and increase in input cost in cost we are all aware of it's increasing day by day so this uh, use of technology and increase in input cost is going to further aggravate the farm situation in punjab and maybe all over the country there is also a shift shift of lab, uh, farm labor to industry and construction sector now 12% people and 20% 1% uh, farm labor those who have uh, left farm farming so these people they are heading towards uh, industrial units or nowadays because there is a boom in infrastructure sector lot of investment taking place in housing sector roads rails bridges and all so because of that many people who exit from farm sector they are heading towards industrial sector and the construction sector then newer ways of agriculture are definitely going to require this people at the workplace 
so in case there's any question from any of the center they can always interrupt they can uh, you know uh, i'll stop and they can ask the question so please feel free in raising questions so i was discussing with you when we experience new ways of doing agriculture new technology is being used by the farmers so ultimately it results in reduction in manpower in farm sector and naturally the pure people would be required and those pure people they can give you the same productivity or many a times even higher productivity the next is the return of industrial labor from different states to their home states after implementation of manrega that also is taking place like uh, from the state of punjab haryana western up lot many people who were earlier working in industry immediately after implementation of manrega many people they have left their jobs they have gone back to their home places and they are getting some assured employment for 100 days in their respective states so this is changing the entire landscape of our industrial uh, sector and also the agriculture sector surplus labor from agriculture sector that does not possess any skills other than the farming now you talk of farmers or you talk of people who are uh, uh, living farming so these people they are basically trained in farming and that training <laughs> training ji ji kya aap aa gaye so this on kariye you talk of farmers or you talk of farm labor those who exit from farm sector so unfortunately they these people they do not possess any skills other than farming hence they find themselves in a problem when they exit from the farming sector farmers who exit from particularly those ab ye hua hai by way of selling their land either to the infrastructure sector or to the industrial sector so these people unfortunately hello 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 possess in aawaz ja rahi hai kya ja rahi hai dekhiye ye mute ho gaya ji sir aapki aawaz aa rahi hai yahan aawaz aapki aawaz ab ja rahi hai abhi on kariye ye dekhiye yahan se hum kar rahe the intro ho raha hai na hello 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 testing kariye can you get settled down mute karke bhi wo discrete nahi udhar se on kar lete hain bar bar nahi dobara on kar lete hain सर अगर आपने टेस्टिंग कर रही है तो टेस्टिंग बाद में कर लीजिए अभी अगर आप क्वेश्चन पूछना तब ऑन करिए माइक यू कैन आस्क मी क्वेश्चन एट एनी मोमेंट ओके थैंक यू ओके देर आर सो मेनी फार्मर्स इन इंडिया हु हैव सोल्ड देयर लैंड टू इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर सेक्टर और टू द इंडस्ट्रियल सेक्टर so when they sell their land they get lot of money they mobilize lot of resources but their problem is they are very poor in uh, investing those resources and many time you know when you have lot of money and if you do not possess the investment skills that may again put you in trouble so the kind of scenario as i told you the kind of scenario which exists in punjab almost similar scenario exists in other adjoining state or for that matter the entire country and this is quite uh, disturbing then now from punjab state let's come to the country wide scenario when we talk of country wide scenario 60% rural <coughs> population earns only 40% 14% of the gdp some people say 55 versus 15% there are others who say it's uh, you know 54% and 14% let's not get into uh, this thing the figures as such but we are all uh, aware of almost uh, two third people they live in villages and vast majority of those who live in villages they are either dependent upon agriculture or other allied activities and the latest uh, figures reveal that almost 60% people they are dependent upon agriculture and allied activities this contribution of the agri agriculture sector which used to be almost 50% at the time of gaining independence in 1947 so slowly and slowly it has now come down to 14% and it's further going to come down when i say it's going to further come down that does not mean that industrial production is going to get reduced what it really means is the other sector our manufacturing sector and our service sector 
they are going to experience a growth rate which is much faster than the agriculture sector. And as such, because the other two sectors, they are going to add more to the GDP of the country. So in absolute terms, the percentage contribution of agriculture sector is going to come down in the country. And if we talk about the other developed countries of the world, so most of the developed countries you would find, their con uh, uh, the agri contribution of the agriculture in, in those developed countries doesn't really go beyond 3 to 4 percent or so. In some cases, it's as low as 1.5 percent or so. So, the, uh, the problem uh, with the Indian economy re really is, so many people, they are engaged in agriculture, but they give very little output. And when we talk of remaining uh, uh, this thing, 86% GDP, this 86% GDP is being contributed by only 40% population. And this 40% population, 40% working population I am talking about. So the put out of 40% again, it could be probably 16 to 17% people who are engaged in manufacturing sector and remaining, uh, uh, remaining people, they would be working in the service sector also. So one thing is very clear from these figures. When you find 60% people contributing only 14% and 40% people contributing 86%, it creates a lot of imbalance in the society. We are all aware of, some people say last 25 years it has been jobless growth. There are other people who also say that during past 20-25 uh, years, so rich have become richer and poor have become poorer. So that's because of this kind of scenario which prevails in our country. Now when you know, you, di uh, you divide 14% contribution by 60% of the population and you divide 86% GDP contribution by 40% of the people, so it will make the picture very clear to you. Naturally, these 40% people, because they happen to be contributing more, their productivity is much higher as compared to the productivity of the 60% people. So that is the root cause of poor becoming poorer and rich becoming richer. And we are getting into a sort of scenario of haves and have-nots. Sort of. The only 4% of the rural students, they join universities. You know, in our country, we have almost uh, 780 universities. But when you look to the environment over there, so people with rural background, where almost 67% people reside, only 4% students are with rural background and remaining 96% people, they are from urban areas. 71% population lives in rural areas and it's slowly coming down. Then 30% of the population of our country is uh, considered to be living below the poverty line. And you know the definition of poverty line in India. Somebody earning maybe 16 rupees a day or 20 rupees a day in cities, they are considered to be you know, people who earn less than that. They are considered to be people below the poverty line. And almost 30 to 40 crore people, they are in that bracket. Rural students, they have higher rate of dropout. Only 52% rural students complete matriculation. So whereas students from urban areas, they tend to pursue their studies. But when we uh, talk about the rural students, only 52% of them, they are uh, reaching up to the 10 plus 2 level. And naturally, their enrollment in education system would also be lower. When we talk of child, child labor in our country, it is estimated that there are more than 4 crore child labor in our country. And despite uh, different legislations, things being in place, the child labor has not been eradicated from the country. Provision of free education and midday meals has not been able to check the dropout rate of rural students. Rather, the dropout rate is increasing in some of the pockets and uh, it's increasing with the passage of time in some places. So this is the kind of scenario which prevails in our country. And uh, you can have a little more information about the level of literacy in the country and uh, uh, why is it some of the people, they are unable to pursue education. 
So as per the uh, figure shown over here, we have a 65.5% rate of literacy in our country. Important for us to understand here is, particularly from the skill point of view, we got to understand when we say our uh, two third, almost two third people they are educated, we got to really look back what sort of education they, they possess. This uh, particular uh, figure will make it very clear to you. 16.7% people, we consider them as literate, but they are only below primary. And 15.8% people, they are with primary qualifications. So you add them together, so that constitutes almost half of the literate population. 16.7 and 15.8. Then only 12.9% people, they have passed upper primary, 8.8% they have passed secondary, and 4.7% higher secondary, only 3.9% are graduates, 1.1% postgraduate and above, and only 0.6% they have passed diploma or different type of certificate course, 0.6% again without schooling, and there are others who are within 0.4%. Zero, uh, 0 so this all adds up to 65%. So when we talk of skill development in the country, now we got to really consider the lower strata of society, particularly those who have uh, left schooling uh, during their primary education system or before completing high school. So these are the kind of people who need to be highly skilled. Otherwise, in absence of any skill, they would end up uh, getting into informal sector, picking, uh, picking up some petty jobs, and whatever come their way, so they will pick up those jobs. And in absence of any meaningful skill, so these people would be exploited uh, wherever they get employed. I think this would also be of interest to you. Reasons for discontinuing education or never getting enrolled for education. So here what we find is, we are basically talking about 92% people, because uh, the, uh, this figure basically uh, tells us about if only 8% people who get educated, so they complete education as per their desire or they pursue those lines, those particular streams which they want to pursue and 92% people, they discontinue or they never enroll. Now this statistics pertains to basically 92% people who either discontinued their studies or uh, they did not enroll themselves. So 21% of them, they either didn't enroll or didn't continue their studies because of financial constraints. 14% are such whose parents were not interested. 8% unable to cope up. There were other 14% who were not interested in. 6% education not considered necessary. So these candidates, they feel it's no fun uh, getting into educational institutions. So they didn't like to pursue their studies, 5% uh, for other economic activities because uh, they didn't, uh, had they gone to school, they, they wouldn't have been involved in other economic activity. And for many such like people, picking up petty economic activity that becomes important, that becomes a source of livelihood for them. So there were 5% who left studies because of other economic activities. 5% to attend to domestic chores, domestic household works, and 4% uh, to work for wages or salaries. Families want them to uh, pick up any wage, uh, any uh, wage employment or uh, salary job. And there were 3% who were helping in household uh, enterprises. 2% they didn't go to school because the school was considered to be very far off, and 1% no tradition in community of going to school or educational institution. There were 8%, 8% they fall under other categories. So this, uh, these are the kind of reasons which I took from one of the you know, publications. Okay. Now talking of Indian employment scenario, Indian employment scenario and these figures which I am discussing with you, they are taken from the Economic Survey Government of India. So 55% workforce engaged in agriculture sector, 28% workforce is engaged in service sector, and 17% workforce is engaged in industry sector. 
Now, the latest 2014-15 economic survey, perhaps this 55% has got reduced to 54% now, and 17% uh, remains almost the same, and the uh, percentage of those who are working in service sector, that's almost 29% or so now. So there's minor, uh, minor difference in that. And here again, I bring you back to their respective contribution. So contribution of agriculture, where in 55% people are engaged, so they are contributing 14%, uh, 55%, and 28% people who are working in service sector, they are contributing 60%. And remaining 16%, they are contributing 26%. So here again, we can find out their respective relative, uh, you know, contribution to the economy and their own individual productivity. Then yet another uh, scenario in our country right now is the way India is urbanizing, and you know, the needs of the urbanized people, urban sector, are a little different than the needs of rural people. So it is estimated. Uh, by the year 2030, almost 46% of our population will be living in cities. And now, with the new government's agenda of developing smart city and all, perhaps it's going to further uh, speed up, and we may achieve this percentage of 46% even before 2030 or so. So the facts which I have presented before you, all these facts make one thing very clear, and that clarity is about the Indian economy is marked with low level of productivity. When I say low level of productivity, I am talking about the vast majority of India's uh, you know, working class. They suffer from low level of productivity and uh, a low level of employment and low level of income. In the morning session, I was just discussing with you the kind of scenario which prevails in the country. In the past 10 years, so we added uh, 12 crore people to our uh, working class, and we could generate only 1.2 uh, crore job opportunities. So that speaks volume about the kind of serious problem we are faced with. <clears throat> now, we also got to uh, got to be very clear about what what is the sort of manpower which is going to be needed by the Indian. Uh, you talk about uh, talk about the primary sector or secondary sector, which is your uh, manufacturing sector, or the service sector, which is also known as uh, tertiary <coughs> sector. What sort of manpower is going to be needed in these sectors? And then I'm going to link it with the national skill qualification framework. Earlier, we used to call uh, talk about only two classes of man, uh, manpower, and they used to be known as uh, this thing: white collar and uh, blue collar workforce. But now, our policy formulators, our planners, they feel the manpower in days to come is going to be put under these four categories. The first category would be basically the rust collar workforce. This rust collar workforce is basically the lowest level of workforce. They are the people who are not much educated. They are the people who are not technology savvy as such. Okay, they are basically the wage earners, manual workers, right? You must have seen so many people, they work in Indian agriculture sector. In fact, maximum number of people in India, they work in agriculture and allied activities, and there are good number of people who are engaged in construction of road, breaking of stones, and uh, collecting muds and all. So in infrastructure sector, we find there are a lot many people uh, who are working at the lowest level. So this rest collar workforce is nothing but they are basically the people who are working at the lowest level without much of education, without uh, any use of technology as such, and they are largely illiterate. These people usually do not have any access to post-retirement benefits. They usually do not have any access to social security measures like provident fund or pension or uh, medical benefits, health insurance and all. So they, they are usually deprived of that, uh, uh, that kind of benefit. So this is the what we call it as arrest collar workforce. And unfortunately, they are going to you know, constitute most of the manpower in this country. 
then the second category pertains to blue collar workforce the concept of blue collar workforce uh, almost remains the same at, as it used to be earlier and blue collar workforce are basically you know the, they are the kind of people who are somewhat educated and rather than getting paid on daily basis they are either paid on weekly basis or they are paid on monthly basis and these people are usually found working in manufacturing sector or service sector or small scale enterprises and uh, so these people because they work either in manufacturing sector or service sector so they would have some access to social security measures their pay scale would be better than the rest follower workforce they would have access to these uh, post retirement benefits or some statutory benefits and their uh, lifestyle standard of living i would say would be somewhat better than the rest follower workforce because they are paid on monthly basis better wages as compared to rest follower workforce they are somewhat better educated so this is the second category of workforce which is going to be needed in the in days to come in fact they were needed earlier also the third category of workforce which we, we would be needing in days to come is known as uh, the gray collar workforce this gray collar workforce is nothing but they are the kind of people who are uh, reasonably well educated maybe graduates post graduates etc they are the kind of people who are uh, somewhat technology savvy they can make use of computer they can use uh, make use of automation and they are the people who are reasonably well educated they can take their own independent decision okay they are creative they uh, they make use of uh, uh, technology in their respective workplaces so uh, we are talking about that category of people the such like people are also popularly known as the knowledge workers so it's a knowledge worker category which earlier didn't exist okay so this is the new uh, category of workforce which has been created now and in days to come so you talk of manufacturing sector service sector you talk of small scale sector or medium or large msme or any kind of organization there would be fairly good demand about the gray collar workforce for knowledge worker in days to come the fourth and the topmost category of manpower needed in the country is the white collar workforce this white concept of white collar workforce remains almost the same the conventional concept so white collar workforce people are nothing but they are basically the engineers chartered accountant ca company secretaries bureaucrats senior functionaries in government offices okay uh architects advocates doctors so that kind of men part we are talking about and leaving aside a few categories sub categories of this thing by and large we have uh, enough of white collar workforce within the country what we are really lacking is basically the gray collar blue collar and rust collar workforce that two people are available but then they are not available as per need of the industry so in days to come we got when we think of manpower planning when we think of skill development we got to keep these four categories in mind now with a view to address this problem of uh, you know the kind of manpower which is going to be needed in the country in days to come government of india thought of starting national vocational education qualification framework in fact uh, till the year 2010 there was no such like framework available within our country and uh, vocational education particularly when we talk of skill development vocational education used to be sort of terminal in nature by terminal in nature i mean the, you make a person join iti or any other skill development program having passed that one to two year course then there were no pathways for that person to pursue the education course there was no vertical mobility at the same time there was hardly any horizontal movement so the people used to get stuck so it was uh, in year 2011 in fact to be precise on 8th of october 2011 the then hrd minister government of india shri kapil sibal ji 
he announced uh, this national vocational education qualification framework in delhi so uh, and in, in fact uh, the all india council for technical education aict being the apex body for making and maintaining the norms for technical education in the country they were uh, assigned the task of evolving national vocational education qualification framework for the polytechnic system and the engineering colleges system later on it was extended to universities as well so aict was given this task and aict started work on uh, working on it and finally the framework was announced on 8th of october 2011 but that was the time when simultaneously the then ministry of labor and employment they were also working on a, a vocational uh, qualification framework and at that time the ministry of labor and employment they evolved another framework which was known as nvqf the word e was missing right so what ministry of hrd government of india evolved was nveqf and what ministry of uh, labor and employment evolved so that was nvqf national vocational qualification framework so these frameworks were based on the framework taken from different countries okay so the framework which was evolved in 2011 the framework aimed at linking the school vocational and university education qualification into one national system and it was supposed to be a sort of seamless system wherein you find the people from uh, iti they can move to polytechnic from polytechnic they can go to engineering college if somebody from engineering college wants to move in the reverse direction to polytechnic or to any skill development course so they should be in a position to do that so that's the kind of framework which was aimed at and the idea was to link the school education system polytechnic education system and the uh, university education system engineering education system so the idea was to link them together now i got to discuss with you some of the same uh, salient features of the framework the salient feature would include first of all when we talk of national uh skill qualification framework okay before we proceed further let me tell you the how is it these two frameworks they got merged so as i told you earlier nveqf was launched in 2011 and almost sa simultaneously nvqf which was evolved by ministry of labor and employment that was also announced so uh for about two years or so so there was a bit of confusion about uh, you know two framework being in place and which of the two framework is better or uh, whether we should go ahead with nveqf or nvqf so there was some confusion and uh, it so happened it was on 19th of december 2013 19th of december 2013 the cabinet committee meeting was held and in that committee meeting it was decided to merge these two framework together if I, uh, there's no fun in having two framework in one country so if at all we have to have a framework for skill development we should have only one framework and when the talk about merging to, uh, these two framework started so ultimately it so happened so in place of nveqf and nvqf so the new name was coined and that new name is nsqf national skill qualification framework the decision taken by the uh, cabinet committee on 19th of december 2013 so this decision ultimately got published in gazette of india on 27th of december 2013 and when uh, it was notified in the gazette thereafter things were made very clear and it was uh, known to all that from 27th of december 2013 all onwards there would be only one framework in the country and that framework would be known as nsqf national skill qualification framework so there is no nvqf or nveqf now it's only nsqf now okay now the salient feature remains almost the same i'm going to share with you what are the salient feature of this framework 
first of all it's across sectors and across the country skill development program now indian economy is divided in large number of sectors and how many sectors the economy is divided in it depends on it depends upon which ministry are we really talking about maybe ministry of hrd has not yet evolved the full list of all the sectors but when we talk about ministry of labor and employment i suppose the number of sectors goes beyond 70 there are more than 70 sectors but uh, ministry of hrd government of india has till date was on around uh, 25 sectors or so more sectors are now being evolved and many many more sectors will be added to that so when we talk of nsqf now nsqf program are going to be across sector you name any sector of the indian economy and you name any area of the country okay and any level of skill so all these uh, le different level of skill for all sector and in all uh, different zones of the country they are going to be available that's what it means in across sector and across the country skill development program it's going to cover all sectors throughout the length and breadth of the country the second feature of nsqf is short duration focused and modular program whatever program are going to be offered under nsqf they are going to be offered in a very flexible mode they are going to be short in duration they are going to be focused focus means on a particular skill okay narrow specialization and modular program the beneficiary or the student would be in a position to pick up a few more modules complete those modules and if this person so desires one can go back to the workplace gain little experience and thereafter if the person wants to come back to the educational institute or vocational training institute one can come back one can again join the program pick up few more modules so like that one can keep on earning completing modules in installment and one can earn either a certificate or a diploma or advanced diploma or degree or post graduate degree depending upon how much time one really puts in then the framework suggests that placement assistance has to be necessarily offered to the beneficiaries those who attend program under nsqf so they are going to be assisted in placement in fact uh, as i referred to earlier after the gazette notification of uh, nsqf on 27th of december 2013 thereafter government of india had taken another initiative and that initiative was the central government constituted a committee a high powered committee to rationalize all skill development schemes of government of india you know uh, 17 ministries 23 different departments getting into skill development somebody deals with textile somebody deals with food processing somebody deals with the uh, maybe automobile okay somebody is working in msme sector somebody is working in textile so what used to happen different ministries different departments different skill development schemes and different methods of compensating the skill providers so this is what was happening and so many ngos were also involved in it so government wanted to do away with this confusion and that's why they constituted a committee for rationalizing all skill development schemes of government of india and they were of the opinion that all these skill development programs they need to be uniform in nature there need to be uniform uniform rates of compensating the skill providers uniform rates of compensating the beneficiaries that means trainees and same norms need to be applicable all throughout the country of course for the purpose of operational uh, mechanism there may be skill program can be divided in two or three categories so this committee met almost four times during 2014 and the entire report is available on net rationalization of central government skill uh, development schemes and in that report also the committee has recommended that any skill development program should be considered successful provided the 90% of the people who have obtained training who have got training they should get placed within 3 months of completing the training program. there are many other details those of you who are interested in uh, 
finding out the details so they can download the uh, report and there are provisions with regard to making payment to the training organizations there are provisions with regard to linking training with aadhar card of individual uploading this information on ministry's website and what happens to those who do not uh, get 90% people placed what happens to those who exceed 90% limit so all these things are given in detail in the report right okay did this has put date uh date exactly it yeah. was released sometime in yes, uh, back around like 2014 back. after 15th august 2014 first meeting i remember was held on 14th of january 2014 then there was another meeting in uh, april last meeting was held in august 2014 and there after the report was submitted you just put uh, rationalization of central government skill development schemes in search you will get the entire report around 30 to 40 pages and if time permits maybe in one of the session i will share with you okay. all the details of this scheme let's see as we advance in this program i'll try to find out some time so the report talks about the placement assistance and placement assistance if you do not succeed in getting the students placed maybe you can get one training program but thereafter if you do not come up to the expectation of the government so naturally the training providers they are going to be blacklisted and once you get blacklisted then you got to be waiting for 2 years after 2 years or so you can make up your case once again before the government <laughs> and if you feel you can provide employment and self employment to at least 90% of the people so your request can be considered again the emphasis of nsqf is uh, when it comes to delivery of the training so so far as possible so delivery has to take place in local language zone if we are conducting a skill program in tamil nadu offer it in tamil <laughs> if it is in assam <coughs> assamis has got to be the medium of instruction if it is in punjab so try to offer the program in punjabi language the program could be of full day duration it could be half a day or it could be even weekends program because ultimately what is going to be measured is what is it you have learned so it's not important how much time you have put in because when it comes to learning learning could take place through so many different means many a time we learn because of our own interest many a time we learn by simply by way of watching tv many a time we learn something during traveling so it doesn't matter how do you learn what mat really matters is the how much you have learned and then whatever you have learned that need to be certified so there could be weekend program half a day program or full day program the framework also talks about recognition of prior learning the concept of recognition of prior learning is if there are so many people in our country who have never gone to any school or iti or polytechnic but these people many a time we find they are highly skilled there are ustads there are master craftsmen right there are very good uh, highly skilled people in different sectors of the economy so the framework also takes care of such like highly skilled people particularly those who do not possess any paper qualification and because people uh, do possess skill and they do not have paper qualification many a time they are exploited by their employers so with a view to recognize the prior learning of such people so the, the framework, uh, framework has uh, uh, made a provision for that and there would be assessment of prior learning this assessment of prior learning would be largely done by the sector skill council and the other agencies designated by government of india like when we talk of lowest level of skill right now say level 1 and level 2 of nsqf level so national institute of open skilling nios which was earlier not used to be known as national open school now renamed as national institute of open skilling so national institute of open schooling they have been authorized to uh, carry out this uh, assessment of prior learning at level 1 level 2 level 3 and 4 so like that uh, assessment of prior learning can also be done by the respective sector skill councils 
then building pathways for international recognition till recently what was happening is Okay. Our qualifications, they were not recognized abroad, particularly in developed countries. So NSQF is one framework which lays a lot of emphasis on, if, okay, you develop skill as per NSQF, and if you possess skill as per NSQF, then the government is trying for uh, international recognition. So uh, otherwise earlier, what was happening is our people, they do ITI or Polytechnic or even MBBS, and when they go abroad, many a time those degrees in some of the countries, those degrees were not honored. And our people, either they, they were uh, acquiring the qualifications from those countries, spending a lot of money, or maybe they were coming back and again strengthening their education and training background, then again going back and then getting placed in different jobs. So uh, there's a question of uh, international recognition and government is addressing that problem and uh, program under NSQF, they would not only be recognized by different universities, different institutions within the country, they would also be recognized abroad by different uh, sectors, sectors of the economy of different countries. Now, the training under NSQF, training would be delivered through a network of centers that could include technical and non-technical schools and colleges, industry centers, training organizations, and service providers. In addition for practical training, laboratories of industries could be used as training sites for skill enhancement wherever required. I want to make it very clear here. There's a total departure from the earlier education system. Earlier what was happening, we were provided training grant by some ministry. So having got the training grant, we used to decide curriculum, we used to evolve schedule for the training and then engage trainer, leave it to the trainer, trainer keeps on teaching. After the end of the training program, maybe the trainer will evaluate the performance of the training and then the institute used to issue qualification. This is what was happening. But now, under NSQF, the interesting thing is, the industry has to be necessarily made an important partner in delivering training. And the entire training, uh, entire inputs, they are going to be divided in two parts. Part one would be your academics or knowledge part of it. And the part two is going to be basically the skill part. Now, it has been seen over the years, very little skill can be imparted in educational institutions. If you want a person to acquire state-of-the-art skill, then naturally this person should go to industry and pick up skill from the industry. That is why the partnership between the educational, educational institute and the industry has got to be there. Anybody getting into NSQF framework, offering NSQF related program, so that institution would be necessarily required to have a memorandum of understanding with the skill knowledge provider. Now the skill knowledge provider could be a laboratory, it could be a service center, it could be an industry, it could be research and development laboratory, or it could be even your uh, automobile dealer. It could be your uh, state transport workshop. It could be railway workshop. It could be any center of the industry as well. Okay. So there are many options so far as uh, imparting this technical skill is concerned. Now we come to the assessment. And when we talk about assessment, here again total uh, departure from the earlier established practices. The earlier established practice was you impart training, you conduct exam, evaluate performance, and then issue certificate. But under the new scheme, NSQF, training and assessment, they have been totally delinked. If you are going to get into skill development, your task is to, uh, or uh, expectation from you is to impart good quality training. When it comes to assessment, there, there's going to be altogether a different mechanism for assessing the skill. So don't bother about the assessment. Assessment is going to be done by others. Just like we have uh, internal examiners and external examiners, and we all being in academics, we are fully aware of it. When it comes to external examiner, 
or external paper setter, we become a little more serious, isn't it? So this delinking of assessment and uh, training, the concept itself is going to make the things a little more serious. Okay. So training providers would only concentrate on imparting training. And uh, the uh, people who are expert in assessment, that to competency-based assessment, so they would be engaged and they would assess the performance of the training. So assessment has to be done by experts in competency-based assessment. Now competency-based assessment is nothing but basically the outcome-based assessment. If they are trying to find out what is it you have learned. And the beauty of competency-based assessment is it, it doesn't talk about percentages. Like in our conventional education system, what happens is you score 35% marks or you score 100% or 99%, both are considered to be passed. Okay? 60% is passed, 99% is passed, 35% is also passed. But when it comes to competency based assessment, competency based assessment says either you have cleared something or you have not cleared. There's no question of percentage, okay? Like in case of driving, either either I say you know driving or you do not know driving. There's no question of being in between. There's no question of percentages as such. So competency-based assessment is like that. But and there be any level of uh, skill in case um, of this? Definitely, there would be levels of skills. You got to wait for some time because all these things are inbuilt in the course. The other day when we will talk about the qualification pack and curriculum uh, this thing, uh, uh, curriculum qualification pack and national occupational standard, then you would know the, how complicated or how all these things have been inbuilt. In fact, uh, somebody was asking during the inaugural session uh, to our uh, chief guest, he, uh, I think so you remember the person posed some question, he, is it uh, expected to be in the curriculum? That time I didn't like to intervene, but the answer to that query was, you see, if you find the person is unable to perform the task in the given marketplace or wherever this person is placed, so it only indicates that your curriculum was not complete. The curriculum probably was not designed as per the requirement, as per vocational, uh, national occupational standards. And had the curriculum been as per national occupational standard, so there was no uh, no question of candidate not coming up to the expectations or not discharging the job as required. Okay. So we were talking about the assessment system. We proceed further. Before evolving this uh, framework, NSQF, the best pre uh, practices prevalent in uh, number of countries they were studied. And when our country got into evolving our own NSQF. So vocational education and training system of Australia was studied. Thereafter, New Zealand vocational education framework, which offers skill training at level 1 to 7, that was referred to, that was studied in detail. Sri Lankan vocational education framework was also studied. And in Sri Lanka also, they have level 1 to 7 of skill. Then we also consulted qualification and credit framework of UK. In UK, they have three levels, uh, and uh, they either award a credit or uh, they award a given award or a certificate or a diploma. They have a very good system of giving credits to the students. And each credit, credit is considered to be equal to one credit basically represents 10 hours of learning time. In our system, those of you who are aware of credit system, so it's usually 15 hours of learning time. So if one is getting benefit of 15 hours of lecture during a semester, so the person is supposed to have earned one credit. In UK, it is 10 hours of learning. And in UK, a person who earns 12 credits, 12 or less than 12, is given an award. Somebody having credits, to his or her credit, somewhere in the range of 13 to 36 credits. So he or she can be given a certificate. And if it is more than 36, that 37 and above, so that that number of credits that can lead to a diploma in a particular skill. So these uh, four framework were very seriously considered while evolving the 
National Skill Qualification Framework. Now, we in India, we have evolved NSQF, which basically talks about uh, 10 levels of skill, wherein level 1 is the lowest level of skill, and level 10 is the highest level of skill. And the NSQF, uh, NSQF that has been integrated into the school education system, after school education system, it has been linked with polytechnic education system. It's also linked with university education system because we are talking of a seamless system wherein there are no, uh, 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 there is no rigidity and one can move from uh, maybe ITI to polytechnic, polytechnic to university and vice versa. So we are talking about that kind of system. So level 1 being the lowest level of skill and level 10 being the highest level of skill. So here we will talk about two cases. Say case 1, case 1 basically we are going to talk about those students who having done matriculation, they want to pursue diploma after matriculation. Case 2 is basically we are talking about a system wherein the student wants to complete 10 plus 2 after matriculation. That means 4 years of schooling, 9, 10, 11, 12, okay, after 8th standard. And thereafter, maybe one likes to, uh, one may like to go to engineering degree or one may like to go to any university degree or uh, after degree, one may like to go to postgraduate degree. So I'll tell you how is it uh, the NSQF has been linked to these mm -hmm. two cases, case one and case two. Okay? Now, any question? Okay. As I told you, level one is the lowest level of skill. And now it has been decided to integrate skill right from the ninth standard onwards. Okay? So level one of the skill is going to be integrated in ninth standard, whether you talk of case one or you talk of case two. Nine tenth is something which is common. So level one in ninth and level two in ten. And here the, when it comes to certification of skill. So this certification is going to be done basically by the concerned school board. If it is Haryana, it could be Haryana State School Board. If it is CBSE, so naturally CBSE will do the certification or it could be National Open Schooling or ICSE or any other board. Okay? So nine times. So any question from any of the centers? Is there any center from any of our centers? Uh, any question from any of the centers? Okay, in case there's no question, I'll proceed further. So, I think so, we are all clear about level one and level two, okay? In both the cases, qualification is going to be awarded by the concerned State Board of School Education. Now, when it comes to level three, in level three, and when we are talking about case one, Case one is basically we are talking about a student who having completed metric, now this fellow wants to pursue the diploma stream. Okay? So if this person is going to pursue the diploma stream, that means the level three of skill is going to be inbuilt in diploma first year, first year of studies. But if this person who falls under case two, case two we are talking about basically 10 plus two system. Now the person has already picked up level 1 and level 2 during 9th and 10th standard. Now this person, if, one, if he or she wants to pursue vocational education, so one need to be offered level 3 and level 4 during 11th and 12th standard. So that is why level 3 of skill is inbuilt in 11th standard and again the certification is going to be done by the school board. Okay, then we come to level 4. Level 4 is basically we are talking about the uh, 12th standard and 12th standard again this belongs to basically the school system and the certification, uh, certification of level 4 of skill is to be done by the school system. <coughs> and the one who opts for diploma, that means we are talking about this case 1. So, yes. The one who passes 
matriculation from open school can always seek admission in diploma can also join 10 plus 2 in any state under any state board so open school uh, courses are recognized all throughout the country and one can join the vocational stream one can also join the uh, other conventional stream so they are uh, on earth. qualifications are on earth. okay so I was talking about a student who has done matriculation and now joins diploma first year vocational. So this person will have the benefit of undergoing third level of skill. Whereas a person under case two who has done 10 plus two and, and has already picked up level four of skill during 9, 10, 11, 10, 12, level one, two, three and four respectively. So now I am putting it three oblique five. That means with matriculation as the background and getting into diploma, this person will have the benefit of picking up third level of skill during first year of vocational diploma. And in case of case two, a person who goes into or goes for university degree, three years bachelor's program, three years bachelor's vocational degree program, here the person will have the benefit of undergoing fifth level of skill because this person has already picked up four level of skill during schooling. Okay. Then four oblique six means so the student with metric as a background. Yes, please. Uh, means you say that only nine class, class nine, ten, eleven, twelve, they will be offered any skill courses? Yes, yes, yes. So when we talk about the vocational stream. A student who is going to work for vocational stream during 9th, 10th, 11th and 12th, this person is definitely going to be imparted skill and level 1 to 4 are going to be completed by this time the student passes 10 plus 2 vocational. So that means if a student who has done 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th and he has not chosen any of the vocational subjects, so will he not be able to do any vocational degree? No. No, one can still pursue vocational degree, but then one has to have a different path. What Option will happen? Uh, that's inbuilt in my presentation toward end of this thing. You will know what are the different pathways available. The pathway available to that student who has done 10 plus 2 academic stream, conventional stream, and now when this person goes to university, this person now is interested in getting into vocational stream. This is exactly what you want to do. In that case, what this person will have to do is, he or she will have to go to the concerned sector skill council or pick up skills by any means. You learn it by watching TV or by working part time with somebody or maybe you have some job experience and you have already picked up skills, okay. The person has to pick up skill, prove it before the sector skill council and you demonstrate your skill before sector skill council get your skill tested and documented, they will issue the credits or a certificate of certain level and if the sector skill council feel you have picked up skill up to level 4, so with that 4 level of skill you come to BA part 1 in any university college and you can be admitted to a vocational stream. Suppose somebody has done level 1 and level 2 of skill, vocational course and then level 11 and 12 as the vocational, then this person will have to complete level 1 and level 2 of skill, again go to the sector skill council, get certification for 1 and 2 and then 3 and 4 you get in uh, vocational stream, school education system, then you can get into the degree program. So there are so many different pathways. One, One pathway could be? Uh, under Chandigarh administration, these all government schools are imparting vocational training courses right from 8th onwards. You see the problem is, problem with Chandigarh administration or for that matter any other state government or union territory, whatever vocational courses they are imparting at present, they are not covered under NSQR frame. Now slowly and slowly they will have to bring all those courses under NSQF framework. Once they are brought under NSQF framework, so then this mobility, vertical, horizontal, changing stream, all this thing is going to be possible. Right now, these are the courses evolved at their own, uh, you know, state level or UT level. They are not and recognized. They are not. No, no. They, they are guys. not at par with NSQF because the fact is, so they their courses, their, uh, you know, this thing. Morning we were talking about uh, bunching of this thing, occupational standard, qualification path. 
Ultimately, qualification packs, etc., they have to be evolved by the concerned sector skill council. Right. So, Chandigarh administration or subject matter, any other state government, if they are following vocational courses which are not approved by the sector skill council, so they are naturally not approved by NSQR and they will not be. So that means in case we have not yet having any of these vocational courses under the NSQF framework in the school, at the school no, level. No, we do have. See, the experiment, this experiment started from 11, 12. Okay? In fact, no, 11, 12, 12, 13, 12, 13, 13, 14, 14, 15, yes. The experiment basically started with Haryana and West Bengal in 12, 13. 12, 13, the first batch uh, was taken and students were admitted in 100 schools in Haryana, then some schools in West Bengal, and uh, Vardhani Foundation, we have invited them for one of the sessions. They will share their experiences. So, experiment started three years ago. So, people, uh, students who got into these 100 schools, uh, school, they have passed level 1, 2, 3. 12, 13, 13, 14, 14, 15. 3 years ago, now 15, 16 admission is year ago. So, now they are in 4th level of school. Punjab state started little late and they got into NSQF from 13-14. Uh, so last year they started in uh, almost 200 school and uh, just last week only I read they are going to add another 250 school or so and at least 2 lakh students in Punjab they will be covered under NSQF framework now. Himachal has also done it in uh, a few hundred school. So the experiment uh, is getting now multiplied and large number of schools almost all across the country in different states and union territory. So they have started implementing NSQF. But uh, my question is, yes. in case in one particular skill, uh, means uh, area, we can say, let us say for example, if mechanical engineering or something like okay. that, one particular area, interior design or, mm -hmm. so if that course, if though, though that course has not been taken into NSQF framework at the school level, can we start, still start the vocational degree course? No. We can't. No, see, uh, if you are implementing NSQF framework, so naturally you got to look to what all is available under NSQF. NSQF. Right now, there are almost uh, 70, 75 specializations spread over some 14 different sectors of economy, and this number is increasing day by day. So more and more courses, more and more sectors, they are going to be added and under different sectors, different specializations are going to be added and that's how the NSQF movement is going, uh, going to be taken forward. So you got to make a beginning with whatever number of specializations are available. I'll name all those specializations which are available. Yeah, let let us it will be clear after two or three days. Yes, yes. yes you will have total clarity about this yes, thing. Yes, I, I know so all about this one. It will be clear after two or three days. Yeah. Please bear with me, allow me to proceed further. All these things are inbuilt in my presentation and there would be speakers coming off, uh, coming from different systems. So they will also be addressing uh, to some of these problems. And whatever remains, well, we are here for five days. I am sure... It is on, on our last day, on yeah. one day before it will yes. be clear. Okay. So... <laughs> yes, please. Uh, Narchana Mehra from Government Hitan Polytechnic College, Jaipur. Yes, madam. Sir, Thank you so much for providing us the opportunity. First of all, sir, I am uh, I am having one question. Like a uh, uh, state like Rajasthan, in which uh, diploma is uh, awarded, uh, means entry is given after tenth. So vocational vocational qualification will be the responsibility of. Diploma colleges or school colleges? Okay. School okay. Second, second question is that who will uh, be uh, design the curriculum of these uh, uh, these basically courses? As uh, I am interacting with under industry, so they are suffering from the soft skills problem of the students. Okay. The first question was, uh, who will assess the skill part of it, okay? See, so far as skill assessment is concerned, as per NSQF framework, the skill has to be necessarily assessed by the knowledge skill provider or the concerned sector skill council. 
and there may be instances where you find a particular specialization is being offered okay it is recognized by aict but the uh, uh, but the sector skill council doesn't exist in that case the regulatory agency regulatory agencies for the diploma level is your state board of school education for the school education it is concerns uh, school board of school uh, this thing state board of school education so technical education board school education board aict and the ugc they are the regulatory bodies and wherever you find if there is no particular skill uh, uh, sector skill council existing then in that case these regulatory agencies will uh, assign the responsibility of skill assessment to an appropriate agency that is what uh achana madam can you repeat the second question who will decide the curriculum, decide the curriculum? Yes, okay. when it when comes up yes please hello हाँ जी सर एक तो ये था कि जैसे राजस्थान में टेंथ के बाद बाद एडमिशन होते हैं तो जो वोकेशनल क्वालिफिकेशन है जो इलेवेंथ और ट्वेल्थ कैडर का आप सर्टिफिकेट देंगे एन एस पी एफ में वो रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी किसकी होगी वहाँ कॉलेज की होगी या स्कूल बोर्ड की होगी Suppose there is a person who has done 10 plus 2 with uh, you know vocational stream and then getting into the diploma first year. Now, when this person has joined diploma first year, and now he or she is supposed to pick up level three of skill. So, and maybe after picking up just third level of skill, having completed first year of diploma, now the student wants to exit from the diploma program. In that case. the responsibility of issuing certificate lies with the concerned state board of technical education so concerned state board of technical education will issue uh, not exactly the diploma but certification of skill up to level 3 and the state board will issue skill certification based on the recommendation of the concerned sector skill council yes. because skill knowledge provider they would uh, evolve the credit mechanism and they will impart training having imparted training they will issue the credits these credits then get deposited with the concerned polytechnic concerned polytechnic will pass on the credits to the state board and based on those credits then state board of technical education is going to issue the skill certificate of the third level level 3 madam have, have i answered your question इंडस्ट्री a service center automobile say service center if we are talking about uh, automobile sector industry could be if we talk about the retail sector it could be a mega store say reliance retail one can be placed over there and one can get the practical exposure over there industry could be any hotel if it is tourism related activity it could be government workshop it could be r and d laboratory it could be industry center it could be service sector it could be anything so the idea is one should be in a position to pick up state of the art latest uh, skills that is what is emphasized so it is my suggestion after a experience of people i said that during design of curriculum even you can also invite industry yes yes industry has to be invited and let me tell you what the framework suggests you is the framework has uh, suggested inputs in terms of number of hours like when we talk about uh, say first year of diploma program so what it says is if the student is getting benefit of studying for 1000 hours in a year maybe 700 and uh, 750 hours are to be devoted on academics and remaining 250 hours are to be devoted on uh, imparting skill now you are left with 750 hours 250 hours they are to be devoted on skill and leave it to the industry partner let that person impart skill 
So 750 hours, then you got to look to your uh, syllabus and you got to give weightage accordingly. How many hours you will teach the different subject? It is to be decided by the concerned state board of technical education and when you do so, you are definitely expected to bring in industry partner. When we talk about community college concept, there again the community college concept says whatever curriculum you evolve, it has to be necessarily evolved by involving the industry experts. And if you implement some curriculum which is which doesn't have the blessings of the industry partner, so it's not going to be accepted. In fact, you got to board of board of management and industry is going to be represented there. Thank you, sir. Okay. We proceed further. So I was uh, talking about the fourth and sixth level of skill. In case of diploma, second year of diploma, you have the benefit of fourth level of skill. And in case of degree, so the student has the benefit of sixth level of skill. And in case of degree program, certification to be done by the concerned university. And in case of diploma, certification to be done by the state board of technical education on the recommendation of sector skill council. And level 5 uh, is the level which a diploma holder will pick up during third year of vocational diploma program. And level 7 would be picked up by 10 plus 2 student during final year of three year degree program. And here naturally the certifying bodies they are mentioned. So in case of diploma state board and in case of degree it is the concerned university. So right now AICT is emphasizing much on level 1 to 7. They have not gone to level 8 and 9 because we started from 2011-12 and right now we have only gone up to level 3 in schools and a few isolated cases of universities. They have maybe either implemented level 5 or 6 at the maximum. So 7 and beyond we have not yet gone. But in the long run, a student who does BVOC, Bachelor Vocational, so that person would be eligible to enroll himself or herself for MVOC, Master of Vocational Course in a university. And a student who has done vocational diploma and having picked up five level of skill, this person would be in a position to enroll for Advanced Vocational Diploma. And Advanced Diploma Vocational would uh, basically comprise of level 6 and level 7 of skills. Okay. So we proceed further. Now it makes little more amply yes, clear about the, yes in please. Some of the diploma courses we are having entry qualification fields like in pharmacy. Okay. So what will, and in that case, if the diploma student, student does a diploma, mm -hmm. he enters the diploma stream. Right. So is it is 10 plus 2 degree. and 10 plus 2 thereafter the course is for 2 years or 3 years? 3 years course. Okay, in that case what will happen is, you see when we talk about a student who has done 10 plus 2, he or she would have already picked up level, uh, uh, this is level uh, up to uh, 1 to 4, right? Now this person comes and picks up level 5 in first year, level 6 in second year and level 7 in third year of the diploma. So in that case, so far as skill is concerned, so for the purpose of skill, the person is going to earn advanced diploma in a given skill. It could be pharmacy, it could be automobile, it could be hospitality or any other sector. Because level 7, level 7 of skill takes you to advanced diploma in polytechnic system. And if you are in a university system, degree college system, so level 7 is going to take you to VWO. Is it clear? Okay. So now we have basically three systems. One is your school education system. So school education system is basically going to deal with one, two, three, and four levels. They are inbuilt in class 9, 10, 11, and 12. So it's very much clear from this slide. When we talk about the diploma, and this will uh, further uh, strengthen your query, madam. So when we talk of diploma, so naturally level it starts from level 3 and it could go up to level 7 wherever you have entry qualification as 10 plus 2 and then 3 followed by 3 year diploma. So the person will end up getting advanced diploma as shown here. So level 3, 4 and 5, so be, uh, diploma vocational and level 5 and 6, one will have the benefit of getting advanced diploma. I think your query is you know, inbuilt and it's addressed here. Okay. 
Now, we, yes, please. Sir, diploma three years is equal to the academic diploma. We are awarding project here. Diploma three years? Three years of vocational diploma. This is equivalent to diploma. Yes, yes, yes. That uh, has been clarified. In fact, ever since this uh, degree and diploma in vocational education, they have been instituted for the purpose of jobs, etc. Government is going to recognize vocational diploma equal to conventional diploma and uh, vocational degree equal to conventional degree for the purpose of jobs and uh, there are going to be notifications for that. Like when they say, say admission Pardon? Admission yes, yes, yes. Vocational diploma degree with secondary It is possible. There are different pathways. Almost uh, 10, uh, 10 to 12 different pathways are there. At the end of my presentation, you will find all these things. All these things are inbuilt in that. So one can move from vocational to uh, academic, academic to vocational, and one can leave in between. One can then uh, fill up the gap and again join the system. All these possibilities exist. Any other question? For getting a degree, uh -huh. one has to uh, go by four year degree course after 10 plus uh -huh. But here in this case, in vocational courses, after 12 years, to study for three years only. That is, one year can be saved. But degree wise, he is equivalent to degree. No, 10 plus 4, yeah, I suppose that was introduced in Delhi, that has been withdrawn now. Last year, there was a lot of controversy. That is okay. Maybe we see that has been written. Uh, no, otherwise it is 10 plus 2 plus 3. It's like everywhere like it's the same. Only Delhi University started it and that has been uh, withdrawn now. Right. Okay. Okay. When it comes to university system, <coughs> so we are expecting a person to join university vocational stream with four level of skill. And here the student will have the benefit of level 5, 6, and 7 during first year, second year and third year of vocational degree program and thereafter if one wants to pursue vocational education further so one will have the benefit of undergoing level 8 and level 9 during the first year of PG degree program and final year of PG degree program. This is what the framework offers. In fact uh, under NSQS even uh, we talk about level 10, level 10 is almost equal to is equal to PhD, PhD in skill. Okay, but uh, we have a long way to go. Abhi kai saal lag jayenge. Jayenge. Okay. Now I'll discuss with you. Yes. Anfil ko chhod diya. Anfil ko chhod diya. Anfil ka there is no question. Okay. Now we talk about the architecture of NSQF, and this architecture of NSQF was announced under NVEQF, but thereafter it has not been changed. Now the same architecture of NSQF is uh, that holds good. The architecture basically talks about what are the different skill level, what are their equivalence qualifications, okay, and what are the capabilities and uh, this thing, uh, what capabilities you expect from the candidate and what sort of responsibility person with a particular level of skill should be in a position to discharge. So all these are given here. Now I told you there is a provision of recognition of prior learning at level 1 and level 2 to start with, okay? A person who has never gone to school, uh, school or college or any academic institution but possesses skill, so this person can be tested at level 1 and level 2. Level 1 is equal to 5th grade of schooling and level 2 is equal to 8th grade of schooling. What is it we expect from this person? So a person who has passed say RPL level 1, ye vakti hoga the one who can take trade related independent decision making. Some, uh, suppose somebody is in the trade of hospitality, cooking ka kaam janta hai. Now whatever decision is required to be taken with regard to cooking a particular dish, this person should be, is expected to take those decisions independently. Kisi se poochne ki zarurat nahi hai, right? And if this person can demonstrate this thing before the certifying agency or chahe uh, sector skill council hai ya aapka national institute of open schooling, if that person can do this thing, so one is eligible for getting RPL level 1. Level 2 is slightly, you know, higher than level 1. It is equated with 8th standard and this person 
states trade related independent decision making and demonstrates the work in a given situation wahan hum baat kar rahe the if it is cooking one should be in a position to cook it here the complicacy involved here is difference between level rpl level 1 and 2 is he okay you know cooking that's okay but you should be in a position to demonstrate your skill if need be if you can do that then you are eligible to to get rpl level 2 now coming to uh, this thing nsqf level 1 level 1 is basically level 1 and 2 are basically the workers level they are basically worker 8th and 9th standard skill ki jab hum baat kar rahe hain level 1 and level 2 so from level 1 worker what we expect is always works under continuous instructions and close supervision he or she is a person who cannot be left independent aapko dar lagta hai ki ye pata nahi abhi isme wo skill nahi hai this person may not be in a position to uh, carry on the work independently so he or she need to be always supervised but level 2 works under continuous instruction and close supervision the word always is missing that means at times you can leave him or her independent okay that's the difference now we come to level 3 level 3 is equated with basically the semi skilled worker okay semi skilled worker and it's equated with the 11th standard of schooling or first year of diploma program in terms of academics ye uski equivalence hai this person works under close supervision limited responsibility for own work now the responsibility element has been introduced and he or she is going to continue work under the supervision but can be given limited responsibility for one's own work at level 4 which is equal to skilled worker ya iti ke barabar aap maan lijiyega okay and it's equated with 10 plus 2 so here the person is responsible for own work and training so no supervision nobody is going to supervise this person now he or she is responsible for own work and own learning one has to keep on uh, you know advancing so far as learning is concerned so that is the individual's own responsibility at level 5 which is nothing but our supervisory level or diploma level when we talk about so it's equated with diploma third year of vocational or degree first year having picked up four level in school the fellow then goes to any three year degree program so uh, diploma first year uh, third year or degree first year what do we expect from the performer here responsible for own work and learning and limited responsibility for others work and learning so this thing limited responsibility it's not only your own development your own work your own achieving your own target you got to be responsible even for the others so you have to maybe make other people work make other people learn then level 6 that's master technician or trainer okay that's equated with uh, advanced diploma first year now we are getting into advanced diploma first year and uh, second year advanced diploma first year is equated with degree second year vocational program and here the person takes full responsibility for own and others <laughs> work and learn see the way this thing responsibility and expectation from different level of workers are increasing level 7 is considered to be a graduate and it's either uh, equal to advanced diploma if it is polytechnic system or it's going to be degree third year vocational if it is university system and here the person takes full responsibility for output of group and development of that particular group so Uh, responsibility has further gone up and level 8 is equated with honors level 9 is equated with masters degree and level 10 is almost equal to phd in that particular skill and uh, here you find uh, they are equated with uh, ma previous year then final year and then finally phd and as you advance in a particular uh, skill you find the level of responsibility decision making creating uh, taking uh, decision under conditions of uncertainties unpredictability or strategic decision making all these things they get inbuilt so at level 8 supervision and management of work and capable of coping with un unpredictable changes at level 9 decision making in complex technical uh, complex technical activities involving unpredictable work situation and finally at uh, doctorate level or 10th level 
level of skill it is strategic decision making under unpredictable complex situation i just give you one example i think so it was in year 2013 uh, near bhai case in delhi okay that happened on 25th of december i suppose and there were lot many demonstration in delhi lot of you know halla gulla and all that we took place and the new year we was approaching on 31st you know all hotels all this thing eating out places they have to celebrate new year and they keep on planning in advance for months together they plan they promote the activity and lot of money is made on that particular night now because of nirbhaya case then a decision was taken the 31st december there is not going to be any celebration in any hotel now that's where these things are the unpredictable complex situation now the person manager overall owner over there he or she has to get into making this decision the now there is a totally unpredictable it was never expected the new year eve won't be celebrated and you had lot of stuff you had invited so many guests you had made so many arrangements and now everything goes away now these are the kind of situation when we talk of the highest level of skill so if you possess the, that highest level of skill which is level 10 then one should be in a position to take a strategic decision this may be up you try to minimize your losses or you try to maximize your profit and you take a good decision under these unpredictable complex situations okay let's proceed further no skill levels and uh, uh, somebody raised question about madam mehra raised a question how is it uh, the curriculum is to be going uh, is going to be decided and how many hours to be you know devoted on academics and how many hours on uh, skill development so this table will make it very clear so here we are trying to project the combination of uh, skill versus academic hours so we assume that when we talk of any student be they in school education system or university or polytechnic so roughly a student has got 1000 hours of learning available at his or her disposal in a year 1000 hours they are based on if it is semester system so 14 to 15 week semester then exam and all so out of 26 week so remaining period that goes in uh, preparation and conducting exam evaluation and all making admission and all okay but if it is annual system so you roughly have 200 working days in a year 200 working days 5 hours per day that works uh, works out to roughly 1000 hours so whatever we have to do we have to do within 1000 available hours so here is the break up of those 1000 hours given when we talk of lowest level of skill that is level 1 maybe you can spend 2 to 300 hours on vocational developing skill and 7 to 800 hours on academic it's going to be the same at level 10 level 2 because 9th and 10th you have the same syllabus same books okay so 2 to 300 hours of vocational and 7 to 800 hours of academic here i want to share with you in conventional system maybe you had little more time but when you switch over to vocational system in a school system then what is going to happen you got to necessarily make a student learn at least two languages two languages plus three subjects so two languages at the rate of 180 hours per language that takes consumes your 360 hours and three subjects at the rate of 140 hours so 3 14 multiplied by 3 420 plus 300 whatever it works out to it will be roughly around 750 hours or so okay when it comes to level 3 and 4 that's we are talking about 9th and 10th standard so 100 hours have been added to vocational and 100 hours have been deducted from the academics overall it remains the same 1000 hours so here you again uh, when we talk about 11th and 10th uh, 11th and 12th we have the same pattern two languages three other subjects so here what is suggested as per nsqf framework you allot 140 hours per subject 140 hours 140 multiplied by 5 700 hours so 700 hours of theory and remaining 300 hours you can devote on vocational skills okay 
And these 300 hours of vocational skill, here again, there's a, if you go in little more detail, here again, maybe part of it you can impart in your own laboratory, but, but major part of it, it has to be performed at the skill knowledge provider's workshop. We'll talk about this thing tomorrow. Okay. At level 5, it's uh, uh, 500, 4 to 500 hours of vocational, 5 to 600 hours of academics. Level 6, the situation just reverses. It's 5 to 600 of hours of vocational and 4 to 5 academics. And at level 7, so you add 100 hours more to vocational and you have just 300 to 400 hours of academics. And at level 8, 9, and 10, it's almost 100% skill development. There's no theory as such. So this is how the division of hours has been done as regards combination of vocational hours and uh, academic hours. Now, here comes the question which Madam from Delhi has raised. Okay, what are the uh, specializations available under different sectors and where is it you can advise your student or you can give counseling to your student to pursue vocational education under NSQR? Uh, as I told you, almost 13, 14 different sectors they have been considered so far and there are a number of specializations which have been approved by AICPE. So under automobile sector, we have five specializations available at present. These five specializations include engine testing is one, vehicle testing is another, vehicle quality is the third, auto electrical and uh, electronical, auto electricals and electronics is the fourth specialization, farm machinery and equipment is the fifth uh, specialization. Right now we have just five specializations. Maybe in days to come, you'll have uh, dozens and dozens of more specializations added. Maybe somebody may become maybe a carburetor repair or somebody may be acquiring qualification in denting, painting, and then maybe uh, some other uh, auto part uh, this thing, the repair this and maintenance. This is at the school level, sir. This is at the school level. No, 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 no. I am not talking about, no, forget about the level, uh, yeah. school or university Sector or this level. thing. So it will all depend upon which, which level are you imparting. If you are imparting level 1 and 2, naturally it has to be in school. If you are imparting level 3 and 4, it could be in polytechnic or it could be level 4 could be in degree also. It could be in university system. So it has to be seen at, uh, you know, in relation to the level of skill. So we can't comment upon this thing, whether it is at school level or polytechnic or university level. We are only talking about these are five specializations available under automobile sector and any educational institution which has faculty to teach science stream, so they can teach the theory part of it in their institution. Practical is to be done by, uh, uh, at the premises of uh, skill knowledge provider. In case of entertainment sector, only uh, four specializations are approved so far. They are theater and stagecraft, contemporary western dance, theater studies, and acting. These are the four specializations available. And any institution which has provision of teaching arts stream, so they can be approved for imparting training in these four sectors. In case of information technology, right now only one uh, specialization is approved, and that's your software development. Any science stream institutions can continue with that. Under communication, we have mobile communication as the only specialization available so far, and this also goes to the science stream. Under economics and finance, we have five specializations. They include retail, banking, financial planning, financial services, and the fifth one is logistics management. So any institutions having science stream, or offering science stream, or faculty to teach science stream, so they can offer these specializations. Under agriculture, again, we have five uh, specializations, farm machinery and power engineering, <coughs> greenhouse technology, renewable energy, processing and food engineering, soil and water conservation, and this also belongs to the science stream institution. Construction sector, right now only one specialization is available, and that's your construction and building technology, and it belongs to the science stream institution. Under applied art, we have fashion technology, interior design, jewelry design, and apparel design. It goes to the art stream. 
travel and tourism has got right now only one specialization that's your tourism it goes to the commerce stream institution then printing and publishing only one specialization approved so far that's printing and packaging technology and any science stream institution can offer this particular vocational program maximum number of specialization right now are approved under paramedical and healthcare sector they are 12 in number cardiology neurology radiology emergency medical services laboratory operation theater optometry then the list goes on medical records science and health information endoscopy anesthesia and critical care renal dialysis blood bank etc and any science stream education institute they can uh, they can be approved as the training institution for these courses then there are some courses in apparel and textile they include basically the fashion design textile design apparel manufacturing and fashion uh, management art stream institution they can offer these courses culture is yet another sector which has recently been added to nsqf uh, as the 13th or 14th sector and there are seven specialization here knowledge heritage a model of sanskrit study is one then intangible culture heritage the second one expressive culture third one then museum techniques then conservation then traditional design archaeology these are the specialization available under it and any art stream institution can offer them adventure sport has also been added recently and under adventure sport water based adventures winter sport skiing then land based adventures aero sports disaster management medical and first aid and environment these are the specializations available nilit national institute of electronics and uh, Ni national institute of electronics and information technology they have been a very serious partner in skill development space and uh, they have in fact they have already been implementing number of courses and also assisting many uh, uh, schools in different states so the courses which they have approved they include mobile telecom system digital switching system and next generation networks then telecom support infrastructure microwave stations broadband network and telecom solutions for corporate and business houses these are the courses which are being offered under the umbrella of nilet and uh, they are being implemented with the help of pandit sundarlal patwa vocational training institute at gopal so we have invited one expert from nilet delhi on the last day of the program and the expert would be dealing with us as to how they have gone about uh, uh, aligning their courses with nsqf and what are the kind of problems or challenges being faced in it so he will be dealing with that so i suppose if you add them together all these sector specialization taken together so uh, almost uh, 70 to 80 different specializations are available across some 14 15 major sectors of the economy more sectors are going to be added in days to come like electricals or energy is a major sector so lot many courses will fall under that but it's a you know a, a massive country 128 crore people 36 states and union territory different requirements different sector so it will take time but a beginning has been made and more sectors and more specializations are going to be added whatever sectors appear over there right now more specializations are going to be added there more sectors have to be identified and uh, it's going to be a continuous process we are only talking about 70 to 80 specializations right now but when you compare yourself with other countries like you talk about australia or uk or canada america singapore so you will find there are at least uh, 2000 to 2500 different qualifications available so one day or the other slowly and slowly we will have to graduate ourselves to that level and we will also have to offer skills in those different areas otherwise our dream of this thing you know reaping the demographic dividend and if we do not start offering that sort of narrow specializations different modules of training if we do not do that then i wonder if we would be in a position to reach the demographic dividend we will have to ultimately achieve that level okay now i'll just take one example not 
all the example and I will let you know how is it a suggestive scheme of transition from lowest level of skill to the highest level of skill. We are right now confining ourselves to just seven levels, level one to seven, level seven. And let us confine ourselves to just say automobile sector. Within automobile sector, we take one specialization, technique, uh, one specialization which is known as engine testing specialist. I told you there are five specializations. Out of those five, one is engine testing specialist. Now, if you enroll a student for engine testing specialist at level one, what is it you are going to teach this person or what is it this person is going to become by way of achieving different level of skills? Okay. At level one, this person would become basically, uh, basically the two-wheeler technician. Okay. And you teach him or her everything about the two-wheelers. At level two, the fellow becomes three-wheeler technician. And all inputs pertaining to three-wheeler, two-wheeler he or she always know. Now two three-wheeler inputs are added. So two-wheeler or three-wheeler ka mechanic ban gaya hai. At level three, engine technician four-wheeler. Okay. At level five and six, so engine technician work, advanced work is going to be taught. Inputs pertaining to that, they are going to be taught. And at level six, he becomes engine testing technician and at level 7, engine testing specialist. By the time this person picks up level 7 in engine testing, so he should become an engine testing specialist and should be in a position to guide others. I have told architecture before. So one should be in a position to come up to those expectations, which level 7. Ki okay? So like that, uh, we have uh, this thing about the other sectors also. I have taken one example of uh, theater and spacecraft that's taken from media and entertainment sector and uh, from information and telecom sector we have taken one example that's the software development. Just quickly I'll give you a little idea about software development. So at level one you taught you teach about computer operations. Then at level two computer operations continues. Level two and three. Okay. At level four this person becomes business productivity specialist, author, content developer. Usse pertaining input yaan mil jayenge. At level five, business productivity specialist, author, content developer, content continue. And at level six, your software project management, team member software development. That sort of capability should be developed. And by the time one reaches level seven in this particular set, uh, specialization one should become system administrator. That means level 7 under information technology, if a person has picked up level 7 of skill, he or she should be in a position to work as a system administrator. Okay. So then I had uh, even gone in uh, detail of finding out uh, how do you go about allocation of time. I think so because of cost of time, I will skip that part. You can just quickly have a look at it. So here is the time mentioned. The how much time you devote. We are talking about skill versus subject. So we are talking about the lowest level. As I told you earlier, 140 hours per subject. So two languages and three other subjects. And here you devote almost uh, 250 hours on vocation and 780 hours on different subjects. So like that, this uh, level wise at level three, then level four, all these details are given. And uh, what I have done is we have already created a link. All our remote center, they have been provided that link and whatever I am sharing with you. So all these details, they have been uploaded. You can download all these presentation from the link which is already provided to you. In addition to what we are going to cover, there are many other topics, <coughs> many other inputs which we may not be in a position to cover everything in this uh, five days program, but they would be of interest to you. So course material has been prepared and uploaded, link has been provided, so you can download it from there. NSQF, NSQF, NSQF community college and some other uh, related issues. So this is all mathematical part of it. And we have some roles, uh, 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 role of important bodies. 
So this, I think so, it's going to be a little too much.